Hey everybody, this is Carl, and I'm so glad you're joining us today for week two of How to Pray. Couple quick things before we jump in. Uh, first, we wanna pray for you. And this has not changed even though our venue and our mode of communicating has changed. So fill out that online connection card. Even if it means pausing this, go fill out the card and coming back, fill that out because we have a team of volunteers that would love to pray for you. They're faithful in prayer, they believe in prayer, and they wanna lift up whatever um, you have to God on your behalf, whether that's how this is impacting uh, your finances or your fears or homeschooling, uh, whatever that is, they wanna be praying for you. You can also let us know on there if you wanna be baptized or even if you're joining us for the first time, um, but definitely let us know how we can pray for you. Second thing I wanna remind you of is one of the primary things we do as a church is help you find your crew. And that hasn't changed. And connecting is looking a little different. We're having Zoom meetings and FaceTime meetings and all different things like that. We're being creative, but we wanna help you get connected. And if you are not, the way you can do that is go to mosaicchristian.org groups. And we have groups for sixth grade all the way up as old as however you are watching this. Um, right now. So go to that website, find your crew. We want to help you get connected. Last thing I want to let you know, and then we'll jump into um, today's message, is simply this, that even though we are not meeting in person, that does not at all stop the mission we are on. And you've seen the baptisms the past couple weeks, but even beyond that, if you aren't aware, the top 10% of everything that comes in in our offerings goes straight out the door to one of our ministry partners. And a lot of that is church plants. We'll tell you more about that coming up uh, in the next week or two. Um, our local partners that help the down and out. And we're even finding some creative ways right now to help people who have been impacted by what's going on, uh, mainly due to economic issues that are happening as a result of all this. So I'm gonna tell you more about that in another week or two, but if you wanna partner with us in that, go to mosaicchristian.org slash give. And while I'm talking about it, let me say a quick thank you because um, I actually asked our team, hey, let me know how many people are stopping their giving because of what's going on right now. And the news I got back was actually, Carl, we had a record amount of people last week set up online giving for the very first time. And I was both surprised and not at the same time because you're Mosaic, so you're just being Mosaic. So um, I want to say thank you. Your money's going to be put to good use. We're going to continue to hear more about that. But right now, uh, in an important time, I hope you're ready to take notes as we learn how to pray. Hey, what's up, Mosaic? I'm excited to step into week two of our series, How to Pray With You. But to get us started, I got to show you a photo real quick. So check this guy out. Yikes. I know, right? You're welcome. I'm sorry. I don't really know what to say. But this is a photo of me back in 2014. I don't really know what I'm doing in the picture. But uh, I don't know if you can tell, but I did not go to the gym back then. I, I did not lift weights at all. I mean, if you, I mean, look at me. My, my biceps are basically as big as my wrists. I, I just had one long, shapeless limb, and that was my arm. But uh, shout out to all the skinny guys out there. That was definitely me in 2014. Uh, I never went to the gym. I basically had the physique of Gumby, where like I didn't have a butt. I would just sort of sit down and slide out of chairs. But uh, the worst part about all this was that like I was thin, I was skinny, but like I didn't have abs. I didn't have all the benefits of being a skinny dude because I was kind of like skinny chubby. I had this thing where I ate Chick-fil-A every day for a year and just suddenly started to get a little padding down by the belly button. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you experienced this? No? Okay, great. But uh, I was not a strong fella when it comes to the muscles. And uh, it was like a vicious cycle because I'd want to go to the gym and like get stronger, but then I'd go and I'd be too embarrassed about how little weight I could move. So then I would just go to the treadmill or something. So and I'd want to go to the gym to get bigger, but then when I went, I was embarrassed by how weak I was and it just never worked out. So uh, some of you, though, at this point of our time together are wondering, John, why are you showing us this photo? Video, or photo? That's a great question. Uh, the reason I'm showing it to you is because we're in week two of our series, How to Pray. And in our time together today, I want to ask the question, how do you pray for strength? Now, clearly, I'm not talking about muscles, because if you could just pray for muscles, I would have done that already, and I wouldn't look like that in 2014. 
But as you can probably tell, uh, today I want to talk about a different kind of strength. I want to talk about the strength that you really need, especially in times like this. The strength that we find ourselves all needing amidst this pandemic where schools are staying closed and savings accounts are running dry and loved ones are getting sick and futures are remaining uncertain. See, we begun planning this series long before coronavirus took over everything, and I even felt God brought this topic to my mind well before the last couple weeks even hit. But God's timing has been crazy in all this because right now in this season, I think we need this topic more than ever before. Because many of us are learning right now that some of the sources of strength that we cling to aren't enough to get us through what we're facing right now. Because there's so many of us who are struggling to find strength as we try to stay sane amidst all the unending financial uncertainty. We're struggling to have strength as you uh, lead your family in love and humility even though your parents' health issues just got more complicated. Some of you are struggling to have strength as you want to lean into Jesus even though you're living in isolation alone in your apartment, but it's hard because it magnifies the fact that you're still single, you haven't found someone, and that's not changing anytime soon. And some of us are struggling to have strength as we endure in patience and tenderness as single parents who are trying to figure out how do you be mom and dad and a homeschool teacher and a principal and a nurse, all while trying not to fall into the trap of comparing yourself to other parents on social media every day. See, there's a struggle for strength in our world right now, more than ever. And because of the times we're in, one great thing I'm grateful for that is coming out of this culturally is that our strength sources and our strength systems are being exposed for the faulty foundations that they are. Because for so long, the world has told us that if you want to be strong, you just got to bear down, work harder, get out there, crush it, visualize your dreams, and do whatever it does uh, require to make it happen. But if in this place in history, in this place in time, if all we do is settle for these cultural, shallow, oversimplified, short-sighted solutions for strength, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to kill yourself trying to fight battles you weren't created to win. You're going to blame God for circumstances instead of seeing his presence in the midst of them. And you're never going to tap into the strength that actually is required to endure when the real stuff of life hits the fan like it is right now. So today as we step into week two of our series, How to Pray, I want to look at a prayer from Paul, a guy who wrote uh, the majority of the New Testament in the Bible. And I want to ask, how did he pray for strength? And how can we apply that in our own lives as we navigate the cultural wars of COVID-19? Not the cultural wars, but the cultural waters of COVID-19. So let's just jump right in. I want to pick up in one of Paul's letters to the church in Ephesians 3, and we'll see Paul praying in this letter for the believers in Ephesus. So let's just jump right in here. Paul writes, when I think of all this, after he's been reciting and sort of uh, recounting some of the struggles and persecutions he's faced, he says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. So he's praying for these people to have strength. He says, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. He's praying for depth in our relationship. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Man, this is an incredible prayer. I mean, God, Paul is going to God on behalf of the church and praying for strength and trust and depth in their relationships with Jesus. And there's so much substance in what he's praying that I almost glossed over here that Paul is modeling how to pray for such things. And that's our big question today, right? Like, how do we pray? And specifically, how do we pray for strength? Well, in the midst of these big requests, here's what grabbed my attention when I studied this prayer from Paul. You see, before Paul even makes a request to God, his prayer is preceded by one huge thing, a change in posture. When Paul is praying for strength, what's the first thing he does? He says, when I think of all this, as he's getting ready to pray for everyone, he says, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. So here's my big thought for us today. When you need to pray for strength, change your posture. Change your posture. If we're going to be people who pursue God, who face head on the challenges and struggles of life with strength and faith, what we see modeled by Paul is that we need to, when we need strength, change our posture by praying on our knees. 
See, I love that Paul even included this aspect of his prayer life because he's not really telling us to do something. He's showing us what to do. He's modeling for us what it looks like. And this is so powerful because at many times when you're backed into a corner and your heart is being broken and you don't even know what to say, God knew you would be in that place. He knew there would be moments when you don't even know what to pray to him. So God still instructed us through his word a way that we could approach him in a posture of humility. Now, let's be real. This feels weird. Praying on your knees, it feels weird. Like, remember when we used to go out and eat at restaurants like normal people before everything got shut down? I would go to Cava or Chipotle with people and I would ask before we eat, like, hey, could I pray for the food? And typically we would just bow our heads and they'd roll with it and it'd be fine. But if I had asked, hey, can I pray for you or pray with you? And then I would get out, kneel next to the table, people would start asking some questions. Like that would feel weird. So when we read this, we think this idea of like having to get on your knees when you pray, like that feels a little obtuse to us. But truthfully, this was also strange to many of the people who read this for the first time in Paul's culture. See, Paul comes from a part of Jewish society that were the religious elites. They were known as the Pharisees. They were the holiest of holy people. They obeyed the Jewish law without fault, but they were also super self-righteous. And in doing so, they grossly missed the mark of what God wanted from his people, which is why when Jesus shows up on the scene, he's just rebuking these people left and right throughout the New Testament. But in Paul's day, among the Jewish people, you want to know how these Pharisees prayed? They prayed like this. Paul instructs us here in his uh, letter to pray in a way that it was in direct contrast to what was culturally familiar for anyone who knew Jewish religious customs. So the religious leaders would walk into the room, these Pharisees would come up and they'd pray with their hands raised and they'd speak eloquently and impressively and that was normal. And because the religious leaders prayed like this, everyone in the culture wanted to pray like this because they wanted to be like these leaders. Now, this could be and is often an appropriate posture to take when you go to the creator of the universe. Maybe you need something, maybe you want to celebrate him. But Paul suggests that when we pray for strength, we adopt a different posture to ensure that we aren't relying on ourselves or on our own righteousness, but in fact, we're relying on God. And this is found throughout scripture. In 1 Kings 8.54, King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived according to the Bible, it says he goes to the Lord and prays intensely on his knees. Daniel, the guy from Daniel in the lion's den, the famous story in the Old Testament, Daniel 6, verse 10, it said that Daniel prayed on his knees. Acts 21, 5, the early church is captured as being a people group who prayed on their knees. And most importantly, this posture of praying on your knees, Jesus did it. In Luke twenty two forty one, 41, when Christ is about to be taken, arrested, and killed, he leaves his disciples, goes to pray, and gets on his knees. And what we should glean from all this is that praying on your knees and what appears to us as a position of weakness sometimes is actually the beginning of you becoming strong. And here's why. When it comes to faith, the secret to finding strength is surrender. The secret to finding strength is surrender. The secret to you enduring and finding strength in your faith in the midst of this coronavirus season is surrendering to God. And listen, I know how backwards this sounds especially to us in America. Like Americans don't surrender. We don't give up. We win. Like it's not in our native upbringing to get down with giving up. That's not in our nature. But many of us are learning right now how fickle and empty our cultural narrative is when it comes to strength. Because culture says, just try harder, tough it out, find your breakthrough, be victorious, visualize the attack, and you can do it. You'll be fine. But what scripture says is, no, you can't do it. God can. So submit to him. Take on a posture of surrender and let Christ get you through it. That's where our strength comes from. And listen, I know the more I talk about this, the more some of you are like praying on your knees, John, like this is the whole sermon, that's what you're getting at. Some of you feel like this is too practical to be powerful or or you think it's too simple to be spiritual. And I know this feels odd that I'm asking you to pray on your knees this week. And I even have to talk some of you off the ledge because I know some of you right now uh, either just won't do this or don't even want to because it feels crazy. You're nervous that you might be praying on your knees in your room and your roommate will walk in and you'll have to explain yourself and it'll be weird. Some of you come from hyper-religious backgrounds and you've got some spiritual baggage related to being in that posture and praying on your knees so you don't want to do it. And some of you got bad knees and bad backs and you're nervous about how long it's going to take to get down and pray on your knees and you'll feel like it's a struggle to get back up. Listen, I know the struggle is real. Like I prayed on my knees this week and, and I got down on my knees and, and listen, I have a toe injury right now And you might not think that a toe injury would get in the way of kneeling, but it does. Like, I am shocked at how debilitating a toe injury is. But I get it. But here's what we got to remember. 
there's an inherent connection between our bodies and our minds. And if these two can be connected by the posture that we take when we pray, that also means that how you adjust your body can actually make an impact within your own soul. And, and praying on your knees isn't some spiritual superpower that gives you a direct line to God. That's not what I'm saying. But what I do mean is that our posture before God should reflect the weight of what we're praying for. And if you're praying for healing for someone in your life who has COVID-19, or you're asking for re- a redemption and a restoration in a relationship that's been fractured, or you're just asking God to show up in your life, even though you've run from him your entire life, you're just asking for him to show you that he's real, we need to follow Paul's example and realize that experiencing real strength that'll help you endure life when it gets real, surrendering to the one who can give you strength is what we need to do. Paul calls us to change our posture and to pray on our knees. Now, I want to get practical for a second. Because when you kneel or bow down before God, it forces you to experience a couple things that are really helpful. One of them is that it forces you to breathe intentionally. And so it's actually going to heighten your concentration as you try to connect with God. When you get into a position on your knees, sometimes it can compress your diaphragm or just move things around internally a little bit. And it's going to require more focus of you. Even for me, I realized that the simple act of breathing required more attention for me. And if you focus on your breathing, you're going to heighten your presence. And if you heighten your presence, then you're actually going to focus and be more concentrated when you talk to God. That's a benefit. Another thing that happens is that you'll be able to rest in this moment more and actually live out what it looks like to trust God. Because when you're on your knees, you ain't moving much. You can't get from point A to point B quickly. I mean, this posture causes us to pause. And in doing so, it reminds us of what it feels like to rest. I know some of us would uh, never take a nap like this because your knees are barking, but simply disabling ourselves from being able to move and do and be busy, this reminds us that our trust isn't within ourselves. It should be within our Heavenly Father. And then the last thing it does is that being in this posture on your knees in prayer, it actually kind of exposes your weakest points. It leads you to be more vulnerable with God because you're in a vulnerable position. It's not a dominant posture to be sitting there on your knees. It's one of submission. And just by being in this place, again, it'll establish a connection between our bodies, our minds, and really our souls. Because it's really difficult to think of yourself as bigger than God and more capable than God if you're actually in a submitted posture before him in that place of being on your knees. Now listen, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're on a faith journey and you're tuning into Mosaic right now, maybe you come from a different religious tradition or maybe you're an agnostic, uh, I don't want you to write this off and think that it's not for you. Because I believe if you are seeking after God and you are really feeling pulled to pray to him for strength, if you're going through a hard time, this is a simple, practical thing you can do this week to show God that you want to choose to lean into him if he's there and choose to not lean on yourself. See, in our culture, there's this increasing emphasis on meditation and mindfulness where people seek to overcome anxiety or stress and they want to visualize their goals and speak affirmations over themselves. And and I don't think there's anything wrong with visualizing things or slowing down and being still and saying good things to yourself. But the problem is, if you're centering on yourself and that's all you're doing, you're adopting a spiritual practice apart from the source that actually has any power. I love meditation. I love stillness and mindfulness and prayer, but not when I'm the power source. I mean, I mean this in love, but you do not have what it takes to overcome all that life throws at you. You are not brave enough to always face the fear. You are not strong enough to fight every battle. The reason this posture on our knees in prayer has any power is because the one you're bowing before is Jesus Christ. The strength that comes in our surrender is found in the strength of the one who is our Savior. Listen, you can have the right posture in prayer, but if you're going to the wrong source and leaning on yourself, you're not going to find any strength. Because it's not in your power that you have strength. It's by the power, by the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ, by his power through our faith. There is nothing that you can't endure. There is nothing that will keep you in fear. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. And it's because of Jesus. It's because Jesus isn't going anywhere. It's because there's nothing he isn't sovereign over. And it's because the cross has already won. And it's only when we kneel before Jesus and receive his grace through humility and repentance and submission that we receive the strength to endure the hardest seasons of life, especially, listen, especially when the circumstances don't change. See, if you join me this week in kneeling as you pray for strength, you're not going to be kneeling in front of a TV or in front of a pastor or in front of a bed. 
you're kneeling in front of the cross of Christ. And to truly understand the dimensions of God's love for you and God's power over your problems, you've got to come to the cross. As Paul wrote in verse 18, like we read, he says, May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love. See, because of the cross, we know that God's love is wide enough to cover the sins of every person in the history of the world, yourself included. We know that God's love is long enough to last through all eternity and to change your eternity too. We know that God's love is deep enough to reach down to the worst of sinners and redeem you and me, even when we were at our most shameful. And we know that God's love is high enough to lead us to our Heavenly Father and lift us out of our anxiety and our depression and our sin. This is why we as a community come to God in prayer. It's why we kneel before him. This is why we go to him for strength and not ourselves. Because God's great love for us was proven that while we were still at our worst, still sinners, Christ died for us, he saw us, and he made a way for our sins to be forgiven, for our past to be erased, and for hope to be realized because we could have a relationship with God through faith. And what's God, uh, what God's word is speaking to us today amidst all this craziness is that when you feel empty and weak and lacking purpose, Jesus is saying, come to me with your nothing but faith and I'll give you everything. I'll give you the patience to love your kids while they're cooped up inside and not listening to a word that you say. I'll give you comfort even though you're isolated from all your friends with no work and no pay and you don't know what the next couple months are going to look like. He's saying, I'll give you the strength to be a pillar of faith and hope as you watch COVID-19 take away the health of the patients that you're responsible for taking care of. And if you know right now that you've been trying to do things on your own all along and you're finally realizing how useless your own efforts are and you're ready to submit to Christ or you just want to learn what does it mean to give your life to him, listen, all we want you to do is check the baptism box on your digital connection card and we'll call you to discuss what does it mean to walk with Jesus and experience the strength that can only come through him through faith. But Paul shows us that when you need to pray for strength, we need to change our posture by praying on our knees. Because the secret to finding strength in this season especially is surrendering to God. Now here's how I want to end. In a moment, we're going to do something we haven't done since this whole coronavirus thing began. And that's experience musical worship together digitally. And we think this is a moment and an opportunity for us to apply what we've learned today and be centered on Christ amidst all the crazy. So I want to invite you, especially those of you who are in need of strength right now, to join me by getting on your knees. I know that may mean getting out of your bed. It may mean doing it in your home office. It may mean looking at your roommate and choosing to do it together. But I want to call all of us as a church to surrender to God with a posture of humility on our knees and ask God for strength, just like Paul did. So uh, in a moment, uh, when I pray, I'm going to say amen. And our band is going to lead us in a song. And for those of us who are on our knees really uh, seeking God for strength, I would suggest that you don't even sing maybe, but that you would let the width and the length and the depth and the height of God's love for you just be something you experience. That you would let the words impact you and stir you to faith. So that in the midst of this chaos and in this moment, you'd be reminded that God in the end is in absolute control. That he sees you, that he hears you, that he holds you, that he is for you. Because what Jesus has done, we don't have to wonder if God is for us. We know he is because of the cross. So let's step into this moment together and let's pray. God, I know that um, as we come to you now in this posture of humility, for some of us, there's pain associated with this just from being on our knees or being uncomfortable. Um, God, for some of us, this is totally obtuse and foreign and weird. And for some of us, we're, we're even just feeling peace and calm right now because we're like, yes, this is just what I need to do. I just need to rest with you, God. But uh, we're, we're, we're a scared people. There's a lot going on that we are just not in control of. And uh, there are obstacles coming our way that we're pretty confident we can't face apart from you. So God, we pray that uh, even though we're meeting digitally here, that you would create a moment for us as a church across all the homes that we're meeting in and for all the people even will listen after the live broadcast, 
that as we experience this moment together and get centered on what is true for us through this song, that we would be motivated to spend more time in this posture with you, a posture of surrender, knowing that on the other side of this is the strength that comes from you that will help us endure, help us provide hope, and help us cling to you. So God, we ask for your help. And it's through Jesus we come to you for these requests. In his name we pray. Amen. When the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me. There was another in the fire. To the things of this world And I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding The power set me free there is a grave that holds nobody, and now the power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, Hey Mosaic, this is Cara and her husband Mike. And Mike was just baptized last week. And uh, Cara's here to declare her faith in Jesus today. And when Cara was talking with our team, she was explaining how she grew up in a home 
um, where there was no mercy and where there was a lot of hypocrisy. And about a year ago, yep. her kids received an invite from one of our elementary kids at their bus stop to come to Mosaic. Mm -hmm. They ended up here, been traveling, uh, been journeying here with Jesus for a year, and now she's ready to place her faith in Christ to change her family tree, was the word she used. So I want you to repeat after me. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> good job, good job. This is Jonathan, and Jonathan grew up uh, in a family that went to church, and so he went in church, went to church growing up, but he sat with the adults, it kind of went over his head. He was telling me that when he was a little bit older, all his friends were getting baptized, so he went to the baptism class, and they actually kicked him out for goofing off. And uh, he didn't really grow up in church after that. And um, about four years ago, his then six-year-old son received an intense diagnosis that drove Jonathan and his wife to pray like they'd never prayed before. And through that process and over multiple years um, where it took to get good news, um, they realized they may have not been in church, but God hadn't given up on them. And so they've been seeking God in a few different churches. Then uh, a coworker of his was working near our building, heard some bass thumping, did not know what was going on. And somebody told him, oh yeah, there's a band in there rocking out. So he told Jonathan, Jonathan and his family joined us uh, for the end of the At The Movie series. And he knows he's been, uh, God's been working on him. He knows he's needed to do this, but it wasn't really until two weeks ago, he was sitting at home watching church online and he saw seven people who said, I'm not gonna let um, anything stop me from getting baptized. I'm gonna do it. And he said, hey, this is what I need to do as well. So Jonathan, we're glad you're here, my man. God's Thank proud you. of you and we are too. Repeat after me. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. All right. Jonathan, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, my man. Thanks for tuning in today, everybody. I hope that spoke to you in a unique way. We'll be in touch with you on all our social media channels this week, and then we'll follow up again next week with a brand new message. Take care.